Okay, in the last video, we discussed the following uh, problem. We have a closed rectifiable curve gamma, uh, or we just required rectifiable, sometimes you don't need, gamma in G. And then we have an uh, analytic function f. Then we have f compose gamma. We call it sigma. Here have it. And if assume there's a point in G A, it's mapped to alpha. It's mapped to alpha. Then what we have? We have the winding number of sigma with respect to uh, the winding number of a alpha with respect to sigma is equal to the the sum of the winding number of uh, zeros of k zeros sub k of alpha with respect to gamma here so zk of alpha is a solution is a zero of f z minus alpha it's a zero of f z minus alpha we proved such stuff okay okay so if that's that's what we proved the this one in number in in this uh, uh, ring uh, the image set is equal to the sigma of the one in number uh, with respect to the solutions and if uh, alpha and beta belong to the same component then then what we know we know the winding number of sigma with respect a uh, winding number of alpha with respect to sigma and is equal to the n sigma of beta the winding number is a constant over the component so we have the sigma k n gamma z k alpha is equal to sigma j n gamma z j beta z j beta is a solution of f z minus uh, beta so we we do have these two and this is about the the winding numbers in the in the domain here is the winding number in the range okay and then after this argument we we learn that we are going to co construct or choose a proper gamma and in order to compare or study the information of a number of uh, solutions all right so that is the theorem 7.4 Theorem 7.4 says, suppose F is analytic in B, A, R, and let alpha equal to F, A, it's an image of the center. If f z minus alpha has a zero of order m at z equal to a it may has it may have other zeros but here we only c focus on uh, on one zero the center it has a uh, order m then there is an epsilon greater than zero and the delta greater than zero such that for ops value eta minus alpha less than delta the equation f z equal to eta has 
exactly m simple rules in b a epsilon a smaller disk okay so let's check here you have a you have a huge disk uh, well i don't know maybe tiny the radius is r and then you have alpha alpha is equal to fa it says then you can find a delta and epsilon so we have a delta and epsilon epsilon such that for every point eta inside this open disk you have exactly m simple roots m simple roots so that fz is equal to eta eta cannot be alpha alpha if you have alpha the alpha has a root a but it's not a simple okay so what is a simple root a simple root of uh, equation f z equal to eta is a zero of the function f z minus eta and this zero of multiplicity one zero is a multiplicity one so that's a simple okay uh, every eta you have m simple root so this theorem also tells us that this image b alpha delta this is really the image it is it is onto it belongs to f of b a epsilon belongs to this one right every every eta there's a at least that there's a one solution one root so and also f z minus alpha has a zero of multiplicity uh, of a finite multiplicity We know that functions are constant if and only if it, uh, zero will have infinite in multiplicity. Here you have finite multiplicity, then f is not constant. Right? f cannot be a, a constant function. Remember that we have we do have some uh, characterization about this uh, about this uh, finite or infinite multiplicity. Uh, three con three conditions you can go back and check it okay so this is a uh, the remark about the the proof now let's see the proof uh, it's not a constant function so we know that zeros of a non-constant analytic functions uh, on analytic function are isolated always isolated okay so if it's isolated it means uh, f a equal to alpha then in the small neighborhood there's no other solutions so we can choose We can choose epsilon greater than zero such that epsilon should be less than one half r. Uh, this one half will be used in the in the few uh, in the next uh, steps. And but in principle, you can choose whatever smaller number. You can choose any smaller number. Okay, so it's less than one half r such that f z equal to alpha has no solutions that's what we say isolate no solutions with 
0 strictly less than z minus a. It has solution at a, but we, we will exclude, except that a in the neighborhood, there's no solution. So 0 less than z minus a and less than 2 epsilon. You will see how we use this number 2. Okay. Okay, this is an isolation of uh, zeros of f. And we have require uh, we require f prime of z is not equal to zero if the modulus of a the modulus of z minus a is strictly less than zero and uh, greater than zero and less than two epsilon. Uh, well, for this for this condition, it actually has two possibilities. Yeah. So here. Let's give a small remark about the second condition. The first condition is just isolation of uh, zeros. The second one. So remember that we have multiplicity m. Where is m? Multiplicity m. Multiplicity m. m could be 1. If m is 1, remember that. You see, we just talk about a function. A multiplicity. Uh, Multiplicity of 0 is 1 means f of z starts from z minus a, 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 a1, z minus a, a2, z minus a squared, and so on. We have a power series representation, uh, expansion. Then if you do the differentiation, you will get a1, 2, a2, z minus a, and go on. And you will see that f prime of a is equal to a1, not equal to 0. OK? So if m multiplicity is 1, the derivative at the 0 is not equal to 0. If it's not equal to 0, we use the continuity. f is continuous. So uh, there is a neighborhood of a such that f prime of a is not equal to 0 in that neighborhood, right? So this is uh, uh, the first condition. So that's why we can assume this. We can assume this. And second condition, uh, the second one, if m is greater than or equal to 2, if m is greater than or equal to 2, you, you, you will get the first term disappears. At least the first term disappears. You will have fz is equal to a2z minus a squared and so on. And one, after you do the differentiation, you, the same thing, but you will just see 2a1z minus a and so on. So you will get f prime of a is equal to 0. So if the multiplicity is greater than one, then the derivative and the original function will share the same uh, same root, same solutions. But again, f prime is analytic, non-constant analytic. So this zero is isolated. this still becomes isolated. If it's isolated, it means it is only zero at this point and in a neighborhood. So there is a neighborhood such that f prime of z is not equal to zero. If z is in this neighborhood and z is not equal to a. Okay, so this is a second case. We have case one and case two, but in both cases we we have that f prime of z is not equal to zero in certain neighborhood. But on in the second case, you have to remove a. In the first case, you you even don't remove a. But anyway, we don't care the behavior at a. We care the behavior in the neighborhood, but other than a. All right, so that's uh, uh the remark about this condition, why we can assume this. Okay, as after we assume this, 
we define a gamma. Gamma p. Remember, we will require gamma simple enough so that the winding number inside uh, for the point inside the gamma is zero. It is one. It's just one for whatever point. So the simplest construction will be the circles. So centered at A with radius epsilon. 2 pi i t for t belong to 0 and 1. Okay, so we define this one in them. Uh, we define this gamma. The gamma is actually this this uh, trace, this circle. For this circle, if, it's ins if you have a, a point inside, then it's definitely, the one in number is definitely one. All right, and this is a gamma. F, remember function F. Sigma and R. Right? So let sigma be F compose gamma. Sigma is F compose gamma. Then remember the trace the sigma is compact. Compact, we can choose a extremely small disk. So choose delta greater than zero such that this disk is totally inside the trace sigma. Okay, so that the V alpha delta intersect the sigma is empty. It's totally inside, very, very tiny. Okay, so if it's inside it, then we get that the B alpha delta is contained in one component. It is containing one component. It's not cut by this uh, sigma. It's not cut by sigma. Okay, so now let's pick a point inside this uh, disk. This is called delta, uh, not delta, this is called eta. So let eta belong to B alpha delta. Uh, of course, eta minus alpha is less than delta. And uh, the winding number of of what of uh, sigma alpha is equal to the winding number sigma dot sigma alpha sigma dot. Right. Then what do we have? We are going to apply the the observation we just had. We have. We have this. Uh, Sigma k, winding number, gamma, zero k of alpha is equal to winding number, gamma, zj of eta, zj of eta. Okay, so here, what is this? This is a one. Uh, so this is m, right? It is equal to the winding number. This one is equal to m. Because you have m repeated solutions. Zk equals, uh, Zk alpha is a, 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 m times. m times. So this one is equal to m. And uh, we know that the winding number, th this is one direction, and let, let's talk about the other direction. The winding number of gamma with respect to z is zero 
or one because we choose the simplest circles inside it one outside the zero zero and one so so this tells us sigma j and gamma z j eta equal to m tells us there are m solutions inside inside gamma right outside will be zero you exclude zero just get m solutions inside gamma so we're almost done we almost done and remember those those numbers those solutions are not uh, are not uh, the, 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 the alpha uh, are, are not a a will be mapped to alpha well you have m solutions f prime of z is not equal to zero inside uh, inside gamma for z not equal to a if it is equal to a I, I don't know if it's zero or not but if it's not equal to a it's definitely not zero it's not equal to zero remember that not equal to zero imply the the uh, the multiplicity is one so those all all m solutions have multiplicity one you cannot have repeated if you have repeated the the derivative will be zero and simple then it, they must be the simple right they are simple they're simple rules so we finish the uh, the proof of uh, of the theorem we finish the proof of the theorem okay all right so the theorem tells us whenever you have a solution with big multiplicity and actually inside uh, inside a small neighborhood this repeating multiplicity is untied untied it we believe we feel that uh, multiplicity equal uh, greater than one means they are tied together uh, originally there's one they and they they they, they meet then you have a uh, repeated multiplicity and uh, non repeated multiplicity means uh, around this repeated multiplicity other solutions are separated isolated okay so that's a uh, uh, idea of this uh, of this uh, theorem 7.4 Uh, with the help of uh, 7.4, we have the open mapping theorem. Open mapping theorem. So let G be a region. And suppose that F is a non constant. Of course, we always discuss. A real function, not constant number, analytic function on G. Then for any open set U in G, F U is open if u is open okay uh well we actually proved this theorem in the steps so how do we do that how, where did we prove it we actually use uh, uh even before we prove it, we use this readout. We use this readout. Okay, the b the ball 
of alpha with radius delta is containing the image. So every point, it has a neighborhood inside the image. So it's an open set, okay? So, so let u belong to g be open. We show f u is open if we show that for each a in g, uh, a in u, a in u, the image b f a delta belong to the f of u. So for every point you have the image, the image has a neighborhood inside f u with some delta, right? And yeah, I don't use alpha, so, so I, I don't put it in alpha. So open just means every point has an open disk, total or open neighborhood containing this set. Then that is, it means the big set is open, right? So in the previous proof, in the previous proof, not actually even before that, uh, not before that, this is remark, after we prove it. So we have, we have A in G, uh, A in U, again, bad. A in U, there is an R greater than zero such that B A R containing U. That's open. BAR is containing U. Okay, now we talk about BAR. For BAR, then we have, by this readout, by this readout, F alpha is equal to FA with multiplicity M. Then there is and epsilon greater than zero and the delta greater uh, sorry and the delta greater than zero such that such that this has a solution but we on we will directly jump to this part the B alpha delta belongs to F B A epsilon. Of course, B A epsilon belongs to F B A R and belongs to F U. So see, it belongs to F U. So U is open. U is open. So this is a proof of such important theorem, the open mapping theorem. The open mapping. All right. Okay, so we finished the proof about open mapping field. Now let's see how do we use this open mapping theorem to prove a, a, a corollary. So remember that if X and the sigma are two metric spaces, two metric spaces, Matrix spaces means they both contain distance. X has a distance, sigma has a distance. And matrix spaces are, of course, a topological spaces if we use the topology induced by the matrix. So F is from X to sigma. And then we say F, uh, we say that if F has a property that F U is open for any open set U belong to X, then F is called an open map. Open map just means uh, it maps uh, open set to open set, okay? So remember, not all the continuous functions are open maps. So K 
continuous functions have open pre-image for open site. Okay, continuous function has a inverse uh, implication. So if you have an open site in the image site, then it's a pre-image will be open. That is a continuity. And here is a uh, push forward direction. Open site then will be mapped to open site. So continuous function may not be open. Like for example, if you have a constant function, it's a continuous function, but it's not open, right? And if f is one to one, we have a one to one function. One to one function is used to define inverse and onto map. One to one and onto. We can define the inverse function, the inverse map, f inverse from omega to x. Well, of course, clearly by f inverse of omega is equal to x if f x is equal to omega, w, whatever. Right, so you just you just move this symbol to the other side and change it to be the inverse. And assume you you have one to one on two and the open map. F is one to one on two and open A maps open set to open set. Then clearly you define the inverse, and you will see that this time it becomes. F inverse maps, uh, F inverse will have an open pre-image for every image set, every open image. So we will have F inverse is continuous. Okay, so the other way is continuous. So the open map normally is used to determine uh, F inverse, uh, the continuity of F inverse. It could, could, uh, it could determine this. All right. Okay, so with this in mind, we have our corollary 7.6. So suppose f from g to c is 1 to 1 analytic and not necessarily uh, on two, we just figure out the the image omega. Then what, whenever we have one to one, then you can go back. The f inverse from omega to g is analytic. And the derivative of f inverse at omega is equal to one over f prime of z, f prime of z, z is what? z is f inverse of omega. Actually, this one is better. Okay. Uh, well, one to one, analytic imply on two, and I'm uh, sorry, analytic imply open. This is on two. Proof. f inverse from omega to g is continuous by the previous remark, right? One to one, on two, open. Then we're going to use a result, so a result, a result, we actually prove a result from Chapter three. Uh, let me see the page thirty nine. What is a readout? Readout says if F G are inverse pair, F G inverse pair, F from G to Omega and 
g from omega to to g. Well, at least uh, uh, one direction. It's not. It's not necessarily the other direction. Uh, omega to c, not omega to g. With the property, this is this is g. G is uh, from omega to c. With the property g of f of z is z. We just need this one condition, not the other one. It's actually stronger. This is a readout on page 39. You can check it. If g is differentiable, and g prime of z is not equal to 0, g prime of z is not equal to 0, then f is differentiable. F becomes differentiable, and no, oh, yeah, F G is analytic. F if it's analytic. G is analytic. F will be analytic. All right. So by this theorem. We can get the uh, the condition like that. We can get our readout. All right. So that's a uh, uh, that is a uh, uh, the proof. That is a proof. And one to one is used to, to guarantee that the derivative is not equal to zero. All right. Excellent. So we finish this uh, uh, this uh, section seven. Section seven is done. Hmm. Let's see the exercise. On page, well, this is done. On page ninety nine, the exercise. You can try number one, number three, number four, and a number five. Uh, some of them are related to strictly relate to the complex analysis. Some of are just uh, the uh, analysis. All right? OK, excellent. So we, we finish this video, and we will continue in the, in the next video. Thank you.